questions that come up with elevated geared traction machines is a term that's used known as lost motion. It's sort of a play on words. Uh, usually lost motion can be contributed by so many different areas in an elevator system or an elevator machine. Most of our focus is going to be on elevator machinery. But do bear in mind that you can get, that a, the, the riding public or anyone can walk in an, in an elevator car and, and feel some sort of sensation of lost motion. Uh, the focus here today is going to be on machinery and how machinery can contribute to lost motion. And what we're going to try to do is get you more familiar with elevator machines in general, geared elevator machines. Um, we're going to start off by trying to identify the lost motion term, what it is, what causes it, and what you can really do about it, or how you can correct the lost motion in an elevator machine. Probably the only effective way of doing this is to have a clear understanding of the components of an elevator machine. So we kind of felt that uh, we were going to condense this whole thing and, and use it as a, uh, as a practical approach of understanding elevator machines. Um, Certainly we can look in textbooks and we can do all kinds of things to try and help ourselves out, but uh, from a standpoint of, uh, of a mechanic or an inspector or a salesperson uh, or a consultant or a supervisor, and they're going to be looking at a, at a, at a particular worm-geared machine, uh, and there's movement, there's a lost motion in it, uh, you have to have some sort of a practical approach of looking at things. So th this, is, uh, this is one reason why we termed it a practical approach of elevated machines. First of all, we're going to be talking about machines in general. As you know, a worm-geared machine could be a traction machine or a drum machine. The early machines being drum machines uh, transmitted a certain amount, of, transmitted motion through a certain distance because it was the limitation on a drum. And the, the higher the buildings got, certainly the drums got much more bigger and wider and what have you until it hit its limitation. So the development of the, of the traction machine came about only through necessity. And probably around the turn of the century was the first successful uh, V-Groove traction machine. Uh, a few different manufacturers uh, take the credit for that. Uh, however, I think it's just an evolution of the, uh, of the time and of the fact that people wanted to go higher in buildings. Uh, just to go over some of the different components of, a, of what makes a, a machine a modern machine, certainly the modern machines have evolved from the earlier traditional machines, but most of the major components haven't changed at all. Uh, we can see by this particular machine that we have uh, certainly the, the main shiv shaft, which is right here. What would make this machine a modern machine is the fact that we have an eccentric shaft. Uh, the shaft is able to travel up and down for your gear setting and for taking any play out of your worm gear teeth uh, once you do have some, some wear in the teeth. Uh, it's also known as a dead shaft or a stationary shaft. It means that the shaft doesn't rotate. Uh, many of the older machines or the more classic machines had shafts that rotate. More modern machines have shafts that do not rotate, and they rotate on bearings, or the spider rotates on bearings. This particular shape right here, or this spool shape right here, is, a, is what we call a spider. Many different manufacturers may call it different things. People call it torque tubes. People call them gear centers or spiders. Um, this, this particular component is a high precision component, which the gear is mounted onto, as well as the drive shiv, and also the bearings are all mounted internally. Uh, this particular bearing here that you see here and on this side are a roller bearing, uh, a tapered roller bearing, which are very, very common in the industry. Um, they're able to take up tremendous loading as well as uh, perform uh, beautifully and give you a very, very high efficiency as well. That would probably make this machine uh, uh, being classified as a modern machine. Um, Certainly, right along this, this area here is our worm shaft, another high-precision component. And on this particular machine, it also has, uh, it has uh, the ability to rotate on ball bearings or roller bearings, thrust bearings being the uh, type that are ball bearing. And there's a front alignment bearing here that is also a ball bearing. Some of the modern machines as well have sleeve bearings in them, which are a little bit more forgiving. Um, there's another area in this, uh, of this particular machine that may be different from others that you've seen, and that's the fact that in the back end, it has a flange-mounted motor. It has a provision for flange-mounted, uh, um, which makes it very compact. 
there are some, certainly some benefits on, of having a flange mounted situation. But uh, modern machines could be foot mounted or flange mounted type uh, hoist motors. And th there is a unique feature in this particular machine and that's this outboard pedestal. This outboard pedestal right here is, is mounted onto uh, a section in the gear case which is hidden by these gaskets here. But this whole section is, is removable and this particular machine is able to be uh, broken apart so it can go into a small area or an area that you don't have access to and broken down in parts so it will facilitate ins installation uh, especially if you're doing a service replacement or what have you. But uh, certainly does not change too much of the, of the major construction of, the, of, a, of an elevator machine. You'll notice that many of the machines that, uh, that you've seen don't look any too much different at all. Uh, probably just the fact that you have this eccentric shaft and uh, the type of bearings that you, uh, that you see here, the roller type bearings, would classify it as a modern machine. Okay. Um, also mounted on this is, uh, which I don't want to forget, is the fact that you have a bronze gear. There's a bronze gear and a steel shaft. Um, once again, it's probably the most precise part uh, of an elevator machine are the gears. Every machine has to be um, handled with care. Uh, usually these parts, when they're put back together, are all doweled together. M many of the bolts are torqued at certain, at certain, um, uh, certain amount of, of rating. Um, it's really important that, w that when you handle these components that any of the machine uh, surfaces are not nicked or don't have any bangs in them, that uh, there's no paint or there's no uh, foreign material in between machine surfaces. That will always give you a, uh, a problem, so to speak. Um, so long as you, you have a, a good working situation where you're, you're using a lot of care, um, you should not have a problem with it. Um, we, were o we always feared that there could be problems when people take things apart, but certainly the way the machine is constructed, constructed uh, it certainly faci facilitates that. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, when you put this back together that you use a lot of care. We have a whole procedure sheet on, on doing that. Uh, it's, the sa it's the same thing with a flange mounted motor. It's a, it's a wonderful design, but if you're not careful uh, putting that flange back in on those machine surfaces because it's so, so bulky and so heavy, you could actually shave in a portion or, or, or kick it one way or another and it doesn't go back exactly the right way. What we try to do is use a lot of precision in manufacturing the machine so it makes it a lot easier uh, for, for field people to, to reinstall this, but uh, there has to be some sort of conscience by the people who are putting it back together that they have to be careful of machine parts and surfaces and what have you and if, should there be an area of rust or whatever or, or oxidation on a, on a machine surface that you can't, you, that you don't notice uh, when it's all together, when you take it apart, you might notice some oxidation. That should, all sh should be cleaned down and, and, and made sure it's nice and uh, um, flat and, and true. By the way, this machine is only 28 inches wide, uh, about 32 inches high from the base. And without the motor on it, it is about 35 inches long. So it's a bulky little gearbox. Okay. Maximum speed and capacity on this machine on an overhead is 2,500 to 350. Okay, so it does do a very, very uh, uh, common duty. All right. What's the number there? Now, this is the Titan One. This is there Titan are One. Machines, there are bigger machines. There's Titan Two and Titan Three. Titan One is our biggest mover. Okay. Uh, what's very common is people uh, is the fact that people will take the motor off. You drop off a motor and save yourself five, six hundred pounds. And the fact that it's flange mounted and the coupling is easy to remove, people will often do that just to lighten up the machine and take the machine as one, one solid piece. But should there be a problem getting it through uh, some, uh, or some accessibility problem, getting it in a motor room, it can be broken down even further. And uh, very often people think that just because there's dowel pins and things and uh, there, are, there are markings where, where parts go that automatically everything will fall back in place. It's not always the case. You have to use a, a high degree of, of uh, precision and a high degree of cleanliness in order for these things to fall back into place, okay? This is a lubrication chart, which, which really demonstrates a cutaway view. If we would just take a saw and cut, it, cut the gearbox right in half, right where the main shaft is, you'll see that we see all of the different components as we're looking into it. Um, as a matter of fact, let me point this one out to you right here. If you notice, this represents the, a section of the gear, the actual bronze worm gear. And this circle right here represents a cross-sectional view or a cutaway view 
of a worm shaft will be using th this type of um, uh, display or, um, uh, or, or cutaways uh, just like this in component parts. And if you can kind of look at this sectional cut of the gear, we saw this gear right in half, and we're looking at this particular representation here, so for all of you to visualize that. Now, this is another uh, beautiful example of uh, a modern machine again. If you take a look, you'll see that this main shaft right here is a stationary shaft, and we also show a dowel pin. <laughs> it actually shows a dowel pin going right through it, but it, only, it doesn't go that far down. It just goes down to a small portion. But it is dowel pinned in, so it's stationary. We call that a dead shaft. Um, we also have the main roller bearings, which are right here and right here. And these are the taper roller bearings, uh, and they're, they're mounted by a preloading. And we also have a, uh, a demountable type drive shift, which you see right in this section right here, which is mounted by bolting and, and, and heat shrinking onto a spider. And uh, we, uh, you can also see and visualize that we have this bolting arrangement right here with a dovetail, what we call in, in the machine trade a dovetail, where there's a step, a machine step, where two parts are mated together, and bolted up and dowel pinned in. And one quick note, this, uh, the reason why we came up with this lubrication diagram was because when we originally came out with these machines, we had a leakage problem. It seemed that if the, if the lubricant wasn't exactly in the right spot, uh, we would get some oil leakage coming out of the, the, the spider area right in this section right here. But what we did was get together with uh, the Texacon people, and they developed a spider seal that would give us a, a excellent sealing. The problem was is that we have an eccentric shaft. And when you have an eccentric shaft, your, your centers move without, without even realizing it. It could be in different areas. And they developed a seal that would, that would sort of like conform to the actual uh, area so that the spider is, is, uh, does work properly, and it gives it a little bit of forgiveness. Well, in order for seals to work properly, you need lubrication on the seal. We were so interested in keeping our oil level to a proper level, we wanted to keep oil away from that area. Well, when we put those seals in at first, they, they wiped out fairly quickly because they weren't, they weren't fed with oil. So we had to change our, our diagrams so that we had a little bit more oil in the gearbox and it would splash up and, and, and uh, take care of that seal and, and, and lubricate that seal. That was one of the reasons why we came up with that. That's a good start. That always is a good start. Uh, there was a little blurb in Elevator World one day about the fact that if you do have problems with oil leakage in a geared machine, probably the best thing to do is to take off the, the, the gearbox cover. And as the elevator is, and let the elevator run uh, in its normal mode, and watch the oil and see what the oil does. Because there are times when the oil level is a little bit too low, it will actually pump right out of the sides. And by, and, and it, it's amazing, but it does happen. And by sometimes raising the oil level, it will do the same thing as well. It really depends on the gearbox construction, how fast that worm shaft is moving, and the characteristic of the type of oil that you're using. So whenever you do have a problem, I would certainly use that as a, uh, as a guide. But uh, half the oil level was, was certainly a standard that I have heard of, and we have used it in, in the very beginning, but we found that our oil level, if you notice where our oil level is now, it's, it's, it's up at the top of the worm, okay? And what it allows it to do is keep the oil level down somewhat, but some oil does come and splash up and come up and, and, and fall right over this little spider up on top, uh, or slinger, I should say, this, this little slinger. We want just a little bit of oil as the gear stops to drip over the side and feed this, this seal right in here. That was the intention. But in, in its normal mode, as it's going around and operating, the oil should not be splashing up and going around. 